Welcome to Rekindle XM. I'm your host, Michelle, along with Brian and Masha. And today we're going to be talking about the American dream, the American nightmare, and burnout. This summer, we had an awesome opportunity to spend most of our summer up in the Black Hills. And one of our most memorable days was a day when, Masha, you were up visiting with us, and we spent the evening at Mount Rushmore. You know, many people have gone during the daytime, and I had actually done that as well, but going in the evening was just amazing because of the lighting ceremony that they do, where you have this visual presentation along with the ranger giving this inspiring speech, and you know you have the video and lights all going on at the same time, and it's very patriotic as you learn more about the four men who are part of the Mount Rushmore um, monument. And you come away with that with just this you know, tremendous feeling of, oh, you know, this is what the American dream is. Like, this is why we all love America and why people come to America from around the world. So, Masha, I know that you are um, a transplant to America and you came over, you know, when you were 11. So what were your thoughts when you came over about what is this American dream? Very different than what most people envision now. Uh, when I first uh, came to school, I was uh, in middle middle school. I didn't speak a word of English. And growing up, we never got a chance to dream. Like, whom do you want to become when you grow up, right? It wasn't the question that I dwelled in very much. And when we first came to the U.S. and I faced my my classes with a paper English dictionary <laughs> where I attempted to understand the day. And one of the homework assignments in my ESL class, English as a Second Language class, is what do you want to be when you grow up? And I remember just vividly thinking about that question. What do you mean what do I want to be when I grow up? I never considered it. Nobody ever asked me of that. And that's when I started to dream because that question really struck a nerve. Well, how come at 11, I don't know what I want to become when I grow up and realizing that I am now in a land of opportunity, the great United States of America, where you literally can become anyone and do anything you put your mind to as long as you work hard for it. And that's when I really started to dream about that. But coming from the country, former country that doesn't exist anymore, or growing up in communism, we were not conditioned or motivated to dream and pick a profession, right? It's already been picked for you. All you have to do is show up in uniform, line up how you're told to line up, and salute when you've been told to salute. So that's kind of like the uh, uh, day and night difference being in this beautiful country and knowing that I get to pick what I do when I grow up because I have dreams and visions and desires and a purpose to do what I want to do. So long-winded answer for you, Michelle. It definitely wasn't about things. <laughs> Yeah, that's a really inspiring American dream. I think for those of us who were born here and who grew up here, I think there's still a lot of different opinions. Um, you know, Brian, you grew up in farming country and in a small town. So what, what did that look like for you and maybe others in the area? Well, only about half the kids were farm kids. The rest of them were in town kids, and that was a completely different aspect. So it's not like everybody was a farm kid, and so they had different ideas and dreams. But it pretty much was the same. I don't think it's really any different than if you're in a city. Um, growing up, we were like, what do we want to be when we grow up? What's my idea of an, the American dream? It was, well... I always wanted a two-story house, thought I'd be married at 26, thought we'd have kids, or be, I thought I'd be married and have kids before I was 26. I actually had a little midlife crisis at 26 because that hadn't happened yet. I wasn't even married. 
wasn't even dating. So I may not be like every guy out there, I guess. I'm no Andrew Tate. Let me just say that. <laughs> but um, we all had our idea of what we wanted to be and the things that we thought the American dream went. Mine was a two-story house that I've, I saw driving through town and always thought it'd be really cool to live in a two-story house. I got the two-story house. I'm not living in it anymore. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so if you do a quick internet search on this topic, it's amazing because you will find just literally page after page after page of people who have wrote about the American dream or different ideas on the American dream. One thing that is very interesting, and I did not know this, but apparently Forbes came up with an American Dream Index, which they started in 2017, and they were attempting to come up with some way to actually measure, like, how are we doing on the American Dream? And they included things such as your bankruptcies, how many building permits are being issued, how many people are entrepreneurs, how many labor participation rates um, are high, how many layoffs do we have, what, how many unemployed people are there. So it's interesting because when I hear you two talk about the American dream and then we look at this Forbes index, it's based on all of these material and labor statistics. And what's really interesting is when you look at what the culture is today around the American dream, it's more associated with a certain lifestyle. So like Brian was saying, it's associated with, you know, the, the perfect house, whatever that looks like with the perfect car and the perfect family. And, you know, there's, there's this idea of wealth and influence and just this whole affluent lifestyle. So what do you guys think about that? Like if you were to talk to people just as you, you know, walk down the street, what do you kind of think people would say about the American dream and how they are doing and achieving it? I think that it is completely about having a good corporate job where you get to retire and have a pension from and good benefits in your old age, right? It is having two plus kids. It's having nice cars uh, in the garage. It's having the very nice home that you could pay off the 30-year mortgage while you're in a corporate world. And uh, then you live the American dream, right? It becomes after you put in your dues and you work hard, then retirement comes, then you can play. That's certainly the dream I've adopted once I become, became uh, an American kid and completely Americanized my lifestyle. I did want a single family home and a nice car in my garage and take uh, that one vacation every year somewhere tropical and nice and go back to the salt mines. Um, it was never about loving what you do and living a purposeful life because that, that's not the influence that I've experienced after, you know, hitting college and getting your degrees and really not finding much joy in the process about becoming who you're supposed to be, not what you want to become. <laughs> Brian, yeah, what on that? This oh, culture, I like how you said it, where there's this, there's certain way that you are supposed to be. And I think that is very true in our culture, that we all kind of have this cultural ideal of the what we are supposed to do and how we are supposed to go about pursuing this American dream. What do you think, Brian? I don't disagree with you, but I also think perspective is a matter of time. In your 20s, you're, you're not as jaded in what your idea of the American dream is, so you still think you have the opportunity to reach it. But as you get older, you realize how hard it is to get there and the sacrifice you have to make. And then you either get there and too burned out to enjoy it most of the time, or you don't get there at all. And you live with that side of it. So just, yeah, it's 
to me, it's based on age, on your perception of what the American dream is. It does change. I agree. I agree. And back in my 20s, I think at that point in time, it was all about what we call success. So climbing the ladder and, you know, becoming a manager and, you know, your your salary going up and just seeing, um, you know, this, this life ahead of you where you kind of go up and up. Um, so we all kind of had this thought back in our 20s and then you start to get going in corporate life, which is what we're all from. And eventually, somewhere along the line, maybe we realized that the American dream is not quite as rosy as we thought it was. Um, there's another term out there now called the American nightmare. And, you know, it's interesting because if you do a search on this, well, first of all, there's a movie. So if you do a search on this, just be aware, you'll find a lot about a movie called the American nightmare. Um, but if you search a little farther, you will find that unfortunately, the American dream has become a nightmare for many families. I just read an article in the Washington Post, and it's called The Death Spiral of an American Family. And this whole story was, was based on a family over two generations that um, started out as upper middle class, you know, a well-respected um, a well-respected path for the future, it seemed like, and yet over two generations, the family was now struggling, you know, just to meet day-to-day -day needs. And what had started as the American dream became the American nightmare. So what do you think of when we talk about American nightmare? What do you see as, what is, first of all, what does that look like? And then what contributes to somehow this American dream turning upside down? down for people and becoming this American nightmare. Yeah, and I kind of think that goes with time. <laughs> you work so hard and you finally get to what you think you want. And then as you're you're living in what you want, like Michelle and I, we were I had my two story house. We had plenty of acreage, but we had an hour and a half, we had an hour drive to work and our drive back from work and we never wanted to cook so it was three or four hours on top of our nine hour a day for lunch breaks and whatever so you know when you're you're gone all day you don't get to enjoy the space that you dreamed about and you start to get burned out yeah i i agree because from what we had talked about early in our marriage about what we wanted, you know, you were very definite. Oh, I really want this two-story home. So you know, we had it. We had the two-story home. We had, you know, a couple acres. We had this big barn, which when we first bought that house, I'm pretty sure you walked right through the house and right into the barn because that was more exciting to you than the house. But you know, we had all this room <laughs> and all of his you have tools to have your had and then we had the toys, you know, at, at different times in our life, we had an ATV, we had motorcycles, we had jet skis, you know, just kind of this line of toys. And yet what we found is it didn't actually fulfill us. It didn't actually bring meaning. And I think that's true for a lot of people. I think you're right on. I think American dream and American nightmare are really tied close together. At some point, your American dream will turn into an American nightmare because our ability to keep up uh, with um, funding our American dream uh, dwindles down. And that article from the Forbes where it lists the bankruptcies, the um, unemployment rates, uh, robo uh, labor participation rates, and et cetera, unemployment claims – really should have been titled American Nightmare because I don't see very much of American Dream in that article. It seems like we have these dreams of what our American Dream should look like. I don't think it's really based off of who, who we are and what we want. I think it is based mostly off of the social norms. Oh, you need to have a house. Oh, you need to have this level of car. Oh, you know, it's competing with the Joneses all the time. And well, maybe your American dream is really living a fulfill, fulfilled, joyful life, a simple life. 
where you don't want to accumulate all of these toys and things that you could rent them, right? You do have to own them. If you can own them, great. But if you realistically cannot own them without getting yourself into debt, you know, this is kind of the tipping point where your dream will become a nightmare because at some point, if you shouldn't have invested in something to begin with, it's going to catch up. So basically, our our idea of the American dream has has always been t- tied to success, but somehow success has changed to material instead of um, internal. Do I have a feeling of success in my life versus look at all of my success? I wear it on my sleeves. And it's interesting that you mentioned, you know, keeping up with the Joneses. Like somehow we think our lives need to look like, you know, that the neighbor next door or the neighbor down the street. And so we follow this kind of normal pattern, most of us do, of, okay, we're going to go to high school, we're going to graduate from high school, then we're going to go to college for four years, and then some of us are going to go to grad school after that, and we're going to, you know, build our profession, um, and then we just we just kind of keep going on these steps that are almost prescribed for us by our culture. And very rarely do we actually stop and think about, is that what I actually want? And then on top of that, many of us in our corporate lives, we find that we're working more and more hours. The average American now is working. You know, professional Americans are working 50 hour work weeks which Mm. is more than the vast majority of the rest of the world. So on top of, you know, we're keeping up with the Joneses, we're working all these hours, but what we end up finding is that we're in debt because we're trying to keep up. Um, We feel trapped by all our stuff that we now have to spend time maintaining. And on top of that, we're exhausted because we're working 50 hours, we're commuting two hours, so when do we actually get to stop and enjoy this American dream? And I think for me, there there came a point at which I just realized that I wasn't really enjoying the stuff. How about you guys? I can totally relate. Uh, I did get my single family dream home or well, pretty close. I mean, I'm, I really love my home and everything I've done to it. But come to find out, as a single mom with a teenager that's here half time, I have all this space. I don't spend time in every single room. Why do I need this much space, right? It's it's that status. It's the standard. And I totally fell full to it because now I can't keep up with it. You know, I have uh, work that I have to do. And then there's work after work. I come home. Someone has to cook dinner. Someone has to mow the lawn. Someone has to clean the house. Someone has to take the dog out. And I'm do like, you actually mow the lawn? I do, did and do. It's usually uh, now the responsibility of my uh, teenager who's protesting every time okay. she does that. So we are splitting up that responsibility. So I will take a lunch break. There are benefits working from home. There, there are totally benefits from that. And on a nice day, I'll take a lunch break. I take 10 minutes and mow the front lawn. I'm like, you know what? Back lawn is on my kid or a different day. But because it's Waiting to do things after work is just exhausting because after work, you you just want to relax and enjoy the things you have. But I find myself that I can't relax. I'm working for the things I have. There's no joy in that. So you give her the minefield in the back while you do the easy stuff, huh? <laughs> that will flip a coin sometimes. But I told her, hey, if we're going to move into this house, we're going to have more work to do. You're going to have to help clean the house and mow the lawn. and At some point, we actually tried to keep up with the house. We did clean ourselves and we did mow the lawn. But at some point, you know, she's in five honor classes. She has homework. I (laughs) we get it. We we have the same thing. We had three bedrooms. Well, we had three bedrooms that we never went into. And a bathroom that we, two bat well, a bathroom that was never, two bathrooms that were never used. Pretty much. And there was a extra shower in the bathroom downstairs that it got used so much that I'd have to turn it on every couple months. Otherwise, all the water had evaporated out and the sewer was getting in. Oh, wow. So. (laughs) 
It's all those guests you were going to (laughs) have, among other things. So besides the chasing after all of this stuff, and we kind of talked about the exhaustion, but where do you think this term called burnout, which we're throwing around a lot these days, where do you think this comes into this whole flip of the American dream to American nightmare? It only takes so much. You, you add on more debt to be able to have your toys so you can feel like you're living your dream. You have your work, depending on where you work. You know, you most people have some form of overtime they have to work. I don't know of too many situations where you don't, where you uh, don't have that blessing. Um so it just starts building up, and then you take on more responsibility in your work as you get older. So time plays a factor, and this is a dream. Is, it, it, I never really thought about it until we started talking about it today, but time be- definitely plays a factor. The older you get, especially when you start throwing kids into it, the less time you have, so the less time you have to enjoy it. And it, there's only so much that you can take on and your body can handle. And that's when burnout comes in. Yes, uh, speaking from experience, it's not always work related. It's definitely a major contributor. But looking at it from a single parent perspective and you have a full time job, you're at work, you fulfill your responsibilities. You come home, you have your kids and your kids sometimes have busier schedule than you do. I mean, there was a period of of my life where I just could not keep up with all the after school activities. It was insane. Every single day we're running somewhere from someplace and it was just nuts. You go, go, go from 6 a.m. By the time it's 10 p.m., you're like, I'm just now getting home because it was just a crazy busy day. It is your work. It is your kids. It is your responsibilities, whether you have an elderly or a sick individual you're responsible for and you're helping walk with them. It's all these other extracurricular activities that you have burdened yourself with by saying yes, perhaps when you shouldn't have. And I'm definitely guilty of that because you have so much stress and you have stress upon stress upon stress that just builds up. And there's no way in a really, you know, busy life, there's very little opportunity to distress and relieve the pressure. For some people, they could go to the gym at the end of the day, they'll find that 30 minutes, they'll just get it out of the system and they're good. But for majority of us, that is not feasible. So we're just kind of stuck in this stress cycle that just builds up, builds up until what? Burnout happens. Yeah. And Masha, thanks for pointing out that, you know, as a single parent, um, you have that extra factor. I I still remember several years ago, I was actually going out to people's homes to do health-related surveys. And I still remember walking in the door of one home of a single mom. There were cardboard boxes, cereal boxes everywhere. And you could tell that that was what her two sons were eating most of the time because she was actually trying to hold down not one, but three jobs just to make ends meet. And you could tell that the kids were pretty much on their own. They were on their own to eat. They were on their own to, you know, try to take care of the house. And when I went into that situation, I just remember thinking about how hard that was for her to try to, she was trying to do her best job to take care of her kids. This research study was focused on your kids' health. And yet, you know, her American dream, like she was just trying to keep her kids fed and taken care of. Um, so that's definitely, you know, for, for single parents, that's a that's a hard thing. And thanks for pointing out nutrition. Um, you know, it's obviously very important to take good care of your children and make sure that they get the nutrition that you need, that they need. But also from the burnout perspective, uh, us parents, we don't eat well when we're stressed out. We eat quick. We eat what's convenient. And what's convenient is usually not really good for us. 
So we usually have a problem sleeping. And if you have problems sleeping, we overcompensate the next day by having more unhealthy things. And, you know, beyond a cup of coffee, we may have a two or three and then refill to your two or three coffees. <laughs> and by the time you need to distress and come down, you can because you're just completely off balance. Yep, that's a good point. And we're just, we don't do very well as a society with dealing with this, the stress of work and life and letting ourselves really complete that, that stress cycle and, you know, come down from the stress. Um, so, you know, this American dream can definitely turn into an American nightmare pretty quickly. So what, what are our steps back we're going to kind of go into the, the next part of this, which is, okay, we had the American Dream 1.0, like the original American Dream. This term was actually first started in 1931. It actually came out of a book called The Epic of America, and it was defined as this dream of a land in which life should be better and richer and fuller for every man with opportunity for each according to his ability or achievement. And then he further clarifies that this dream is really that every man and woman should be able to attain to the fullest stature of which they are innately capable. So it was the idea of fulfilling our potential. So that was the original American dream. Over time now, it's kind of become more about our success, our lifestyle, our stuff. How do we, okay, so that's kind of American dream 2.0. How do we go to the next version, American Dream 3.0? What do we need to do to get back to a better American Dream? I want to go back to the 1931 one defined in this Adam's book. <laughs> um, so he does talk about a better, richer, and fuller life for every man. And we somehow latched on to the richer part. Mm -hmm. We did. We did. Because that's how people define success. It's just like in times of starvation, the rich man is the desired, or the fat man is the desired um, achievement of success, of the whatever dream in whatever country. Because if they have enough to have fat, then they've, Got enough money to eat. They so have arrived. I, I think that's, I don't think that's just an American dream gone wrong. I think that's just man's perspective in general is we tend to think that money is our solution. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think that's where this, uh, the media comes in, and it's all about the money and having things, and here's one better to have, just, you know, having this handbag's not good enough, you know, you just got it at a discount store, you need to have this one, and it's cost $5,000, that's real success, that's what it looks like, and I'm like, it does the same thing. Okay, so for me to be viewed as successful in someone else's eye, I need to have a $5,000 purse than just, you know, something that I may really like and it meets the need. So I think you're right. I think that's, People... a, I, I think that's a good point. TV has done a major, TV tends to drive the idea of where we should be in our life. So yes, the commercials, they used to, you know, the, the catalogs that people used to use, they'd get the JCPenney wow. catalog, the Sears catalogs, you know, that they, they was doing the same thing. That? You, You're really old. That has nothing to do with me <laughs> being old. I have families that had outhouses that that was their, you know, it, it it's a generation or two from that, you know, it's not like everybody had electricity for the last hundred years. Well, should say, I shouldn't say electricity. We, they had electricity, but they may not have had running water in the house. Mm -hmm. But um, as TV has gone in and the commercial saying, well, you have to have this and you have to have that. And we've been getting inundated with that as a kid. There's nothing better. The biggest sell is child toys during cartoon time, you know, mm -hmm. that inundates us on, on the idea that 
Ooh, I want it. I want it. I need it. I need it. I have to have it. And that gives us, that changes our perspective on how we get ahead. That is so true. And, uh, you know, usually the simplicity is the best way to fulfill the need. But yet we look for complexity to fill the void because we associate complexity with glamour and success and being something we're not. But what I'm observing in this generation that's growing up right now, the generation Zers, is there's very little authenticity in the things that they pursue. It is a lot related to, oh, this influencer is doing this. I got to do this and I got to do one better. And I question, well, why? What's the purpose you're trying to fill here? And there's just, oh, I just want it. And it's the want, not the purposeful need. So I'm trying to influence some of those uh, teenagers in, in my life that I can. And bringing them back to simplicity is actually getting the results that they want. Choosing the more complex solution, uh, for example, skincare. You know, skincare doesn't have to be complex. It just needs to be effective. And to be effective, it's usually simple. But you get indulged into this, oh, this influencer, they're promoting this, and it looks good on them. So some of the teenagers I know, they bought for it, and now their skin is, um, is, is struggling because of all of the extra ingredients they, they were putting on them, and it takes time to recover. So going back to the basics, to the simple solutions, they're beginning to see a reward from that. So Michelle, going to your American Dream 3.0, Perhaps shining the light and showing individuals, well, it's really, American Dream is really not about what you can have and how much they're of and who has what you want. It's really identifying what is it within yourself that will serve you and fulfill you and will provide joy and purpose to your journey. Because American Dream, to me now, is enjoying your life, enjoying the journey. Every day should be filled with joy and purpose. And it seems like one of those la la lands right now, but it is possible. You can change your mindset to start seeking that and deciding what's extra in your life that doesn't serve your purpose. And do you really need to have that in your life? That's a really good point. Um, as Brian and I have stepped into a new lifestyle where we got rid of the vast majority of our stuff, sold our house, got rid of almost all of our stuff as well. And now we are full-time RVing around the country. You know, and it's super interesting because I don't miss any of the stuff. I really don't. And I actually don't mind the fact that I can't go out and buy a lot of stuff because I don't have anywhere to put it. It's, it's kind of freeing. Um, you know, it's interesting how what we thought was the American dream when we got there, Brian and I, there were times we'd both kind of look at each other and go, this isn't really what we thought. And then on top of it, you know, we're working all these hours. We don't really have time to enjoy it. But now, now that we've chosen a different American dream, we're still busy because that's life, but it's nothing like that corporate rat race. And we find that you're right, simpler is often better where the things you do enjoy, nature and time and getting to go see things and do things, sometimes that's worth more. So would you- Multiple documentation shy? where, there's multiple documentation where people from secluded areas that haven't seen all of the new tech and the new gadgets and I haven't even necessarily really had an experience with electricity, were happier before they were introduced. So, so having more stuff is definitely not always a better thing, like you were saying. So, Michelle Bryan, would you agree to the statement that you're no longer enslaved by your possessions? At the moment, I mean, 
we've lived here for two years or almost two years, but there are also some things that we would like to have and are working towards, we're working towards our American Dream 3.0. And that's, well, that mean, doesn't mean that we will be as simple living as we are now, but it's something we'll have to, or at least I will have to keep track of because I do like my toys. I'm just not always fully attached to them. I can get rid of them just as easily as I buy them, but I do like my toys. He does like his toys. And you know what they say about men's toys? They're just more expensive. Mm. But, you know, it's interesting because our dreams are changing. So our, our idea of the American dream, but what's also changed is our mindset about work and the rest of life. So instead of seeing it as, oh, I'm going to go work in order to achieve the American dream, which is primarily all this stuff. No, no. The American dream now is the work that we do and the purpose that we're fulfilling and finding meaning in our work and our life and kind of putting it all together rather than seeing it as, oh, no, work is just something I do in order to achieve the American dream. So would you agree with the statement that if you love what you do, you never have to work a day in your life? It's not a new concept. <laughs> it's not a very well-known one. You know, everybody throws that phrase around, but I think it doesn't matter what work you do. There is still work that feels like work. But I would say that's 95% correct, maybe 80 to 95% correct, because there's you can't ever do what you love 100%. There's always those pesky things you got to do, you know, the chores. Um, and work life is no different. There are chores in work life, the things that you just, that you have to do. But when you have a purpose and a meaning and when you've thought about what it is you actually want versus just doing your work and your life the way that culture says you should, I think you find that even those chores are perhaps not as onerous. I don't know. Do you agree, Brian? I'm not sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, ha I have some very odorous chores. <laughs> He's referring to our black tank and the, the joy of dumping that as we move around the country. There you go. <laughs> the downside of RV life. That's where those masks come in handy. <laughs> no. So what about uh, you, Masha? Oh, what was that? Not the mask you need, it's the gloves. Yep, uh -huh. I agree. Not that I do it. <laughs> <laughs> so Masha, what curious about what your American dream looks like now? You know, being a business owner before my corporate life, I've kind of lived both ends of the spectrum of the American dream. My parents had this very distorted perception of the American dream, and it's still go work at corporate, suffer through, 65, retire, and bam, you can enjoy life. I'm like, whoa, <laughs> I don't want to live majority of my life not loving what I do and, you know, having to struggle through that. And coming out of the corporate mindset of, you know, people indulge in corporate world and trust corporate more, world more than a business ownership for job security, right? But realizing the job security in corporate world is not all that great either. And perhaps taking the business risks is more lucrative because you are in full decision making at that time of making those decisions. So for me, American Dream has become really finding that balance, finding that work-life balance. I do want to indulge in work that I love. I want to have a purposeful, joy-filled days. Of course, they're not going to be there all the time. You have to look for it. But really getting rid of the extra, and, and I'm really craving simplicity. I'm really struggling with now that I have all the stuff, 
I feel like I'm enslaved to it. I'm not finding joy in the stuff. So going back to the basics and and really looking in within my heart, what is it that I want to do? What What is it that I want to live a footprint off, right? Because the work is not who you are, but what you do should be meaningful. And seeking that work-life balance where you where I pursue my goals and dreams and ambitions with very intentional way to bring meaning to others through my work is really is really where my heart is. It's not about stuff. It's not about you know working until 65 and then enjoying life. It's really finding joy in every day. Even if you don't have a very joyful day, heck, there's so many things you can find joy in just by changing your mindset. And that's really a new life for me is building the life that that I that I want to live every day, not the one I want to struggle to keep up with every day. And not the one that gives you nightmares at night. True. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, any other any final thoughts on the American dream, the American nightmare or your new dream? I do have a question for the group to consider, too. For our listeners, how can we help them take a look at their life and really assess, are they an American dream or are they in the American nightmare? And what steps can they start taking to really pursue a meaningful American dream, per se? I think in our modern American life, we are constantly running So we're running from activity to activity, from work to other activities throughout the evening, and then we go home and most of us watch TV or we scroll on our social media. My question for readers is, do you ever take time to even stop and think about what you actually want your life to look like? Brian and I had kind of done this off and on for years before we both just decided we were completely burned out with corporate life and it was time to take the leap. But, you know, we'd have these these dreamy conversations and we talked about all kinds of crazy things, whether it was, you know, bed and breakfast, owning a campground, owning a retreat center. I mean, we, we went all over the board. And those times where we would just stop and dream are some of the things we went back to when we decided to make this lifestyle leap. So I guess the first thing I would say is stop and turn off all of the distractions and the noises, the TV, you know, everything around you, and actually take some time to dream again. I mean, this is the American dream. That requires that you, you take that time to actually think about what you want, not necessarily what everyone thinks you should want. And for those of you who are saying, I have no time to dream, I challenge you to stop scrolling and you'll be amazed to find all the time that you need. <laughs> On that point, Masha, so when I, when I was back in research, oh, give me a second, not done yet. You know, they say the average American, we watch anywhere from three to six hours of TV per day, even on weekdays. So that's where you get that time. I think you got to evaluate what you're working on, whether you enjoy it or not, but also what is your outside of work environment like? So you want to be, to have a successful American dream, you want to be happy at what you do, but you also need to be happy in your outside environment. So if you're constantly going from one thing to the next and the next, and you're not slowing down to see what you like, that's going to wear you out as well. And your American dream is going to, you're going to get burnt out one way or the other, either through job or what you're doing outside or a combination of both. So it's a, it's a balance. You got to find that balance and you got to be content with what you're doing. If you're happy at your work and you're happy with your outside life so your social life your family life your your church life whatever 
you, you need to find that balance and that's where your American dream will become in. I mean, the money is important, but if you're content with what you have, the money is less important. And my advice to our listeners is do a mindset check, do a catalog of your thoughts and your words that come out of your mouth. Those are your either red flags or green flags to what's going on on the inside. And I can understand that we may not have time or desire, really, it's desire to do the deep dive and understand where we are, where we want to be. It should be an annual evaluation to make sure that you're staying on track with your American dream and not fall victim to an American nightmare. So start cataloging. What kind of words come out of your mouth? What kind of thoughts do you have in your mind? And then eventually start tracing them back. What is the cause? What is the source of those stressors or of those negative things that pollute your days? And you got to also understand that your days impact your family's days. And whatever energy you bring into your home, that's the foundation you're setting for wellness or lag thereof within your household. So simple things that you can start doing to reflect and really understand, am I living the American dream? Could this look a little better for me? Or is this as good as it gets? Good advice. I like that at least once a year. And, you know, we probably should do it more often, but at the very least once a year as we're coming into fall season. I think that's great advice as we start thinking about the next year. Join us next time as we continue our conversation of the American dream. And we talk to David Steen, a brand new author who made the decision to leave the typical American dream and to pursue his own American dream.